comes from the book of Genesis, uh, chapters 2, contained in chapters 2 and chapter 3. We begin uh, in chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and then 3 and 1 through 7. Hear now the word of the Lord. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He, the serpent, said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delightful to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her. And he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And then they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, we're now four days into the season of Lent, which began on Ash Wednesday. And friends, i got to tell you, I'm kind of struggling through it a little bit. I shared on Wednesday in our Ash Wednesday service... Uh, that during the season of Lent, which is a, a traditional time in which people fast from certain things, or they take on a certain discipline, during this season I have braved the murky waters of giving up television. <laughs> now as a sports fan, particularly a Duke basketball fan, that is really hard. Uh, I mentioned this on Wednesday evening. I don't know how much uh, thought I actually put into the fact that Wednesday, which was Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent, was also the Duke-North Carolina basketball game, uh, which for any of us folks here, Florida, Florida State is a good rivalry. I'm here to tell you, I'm willing to attest, David, Mary Lou can back me up. As a Floridian, it has nothing on the Duke-North Carolina rivalry. I mean, not only do Florida and Florida State not like each other, and Duke UNC don't like each other, they're like eight miles apart. So it is, it is pretty intense. So I ended up giving up television on the night of one of the best basketball games of the year. So I do covet your prayers. Um, I think I may have picked a difficult time to do that. I mean, I'm here to confess to you. As I shared with you, during the Lenten season, uh, it's a time where we as the church will traditionally fast from something. Now this isn't a time to just say, you know what, I need to quit drinking, so let me stop it. Because, again, after Lent, you pick it back up. So uh, those things we want to keep, uh, if, if there are things we want to try to win our lives with for good, we want to uh, do that in general, not just at Lent. Uh, but we'll give up something. Maybe it's chocolate. Maybe it's Facebook. Maybe it's television. Uh, maybe it's, uh, I don't know, certain activities we partake in. Uh, and what we do is we, we, we're supposed to spend some time in prayer and devotion, confession, mission, service during the times that we would normally have been partaking in those things. Maybe, you know, last year I gave up eating meat. So when I would think about eating meat, instead I was supposed to spend time in prayer and something like that. So it was kind of based back on the ancient uh, practice of, of what was called asceticism. Uh, it's the ascetic ideal, which basically comes down to the fact that we give up something. Uh, it's based on the idea that as Christians, following God is uh, both something that is very enjoyable and it's something that requires a little bit from us. So the ascetic ideal is based kind of on the fact that we should feel a little bit of pain. I don't think God is about trying to make us hurt, but we realize that it's sometimes following God is rather difficult. Sometimes it requires quite a bit from us. So the ascetic ideal is, is giving up something enjoyable so as to connect with God. Now there are two kind of practical reasons that we'll do that. The first reason that we'll engage in fasting is, number one, it frees up time and energy. Because, brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you, believe it or not, a lot of these things that we engage in, uh, the world might call them time sucks. <coughs> things that suck our time away from us. Especially, I, I find myself involved, whether it's television or social media, I can get rid of, you know, 
30 minutes, an hour, no problem, just sitting on that stuff. So we rid ourselves of those things to clear out some time in our lives to spend time with God. And the second reason we do it is because it reminds us of our greater purpose in life, and that is to connect with our Creator. So during the season of Lent is a time where we give something up. So if you haven't already, there's still time, and I encourage you all to prayerfully consider uh, time to maybe fast from something. Uh, Sundays are a time where we uh, partake in those things. They're little Easter's for us. But I encourage you to partake in, in, in some sort of fast during this season of Lent. Now beyond certain things that we fast from uh, to connect with God, and we'll pick back up later, there are certain things in life that we're called to give up and not take back on. Maybe things in our lives that, uh, frankly, are kind of obstacles to following God. Things that get in the way of of our Christian faith. Things that uh, we're called to give up on a more permanent basis beyond chocolate or Lent or, or TV or Facebook. So during this sermon series, we're going to look at these things that uh, as followers of Christ, we're called to, to give up for good in our lives. Uh, so in this sermon series, we're calling it Give It Up and Let It Go. So we're going to look at these things, and I figured we'll just start by ripping off the, the band-aid uh, and get one of the toughest ones right at the beginning. Friends, Today we're going to talk about giving up control. Now are there any control freaks in here? And I say that lovingly as one of those myself. So if you're anything like me, hearing this kind of makes you squirm in your seats a little bit. Napoleon Hill, in his best-selling book, Think and Grow Rich, writes, You are the master of your own destiny. You can influence, direct, and control your own environment. You can make your life what you want it to be. Now, in this quote, I believe Hill summarizes a goal that many of us have either consciously or subconsciously sought after in our own lives, to be the masters of our own destiny. I mean, I imagine parents, you all have raised your kids uh, with the idea that if they can think it, they can do it, right? If you can dream it, if you have any aspiration to be this, nothing should hold you back. You control what you become. We raise our kids to do that. We've, many of us have given each other pep talks when we see that someone else is down. Encourage them to take control over their lives. This is something that I myself strive to do in my own life, to work hard, to give everything that I have, to plan ahead so that I can make things happen in my own life. Because friends, we know that the world around us is pretty unpredictable, amen? amen. So we realize just how important human agency is, that we can control what happens to us in our life. Or at least, we, we may not be able to control what happens to us, but we can control how we respond to it. So then we come here to church this morning and hear about giving up control. I don't really feel great about that. It's a little uncomfortable, isn't it? You see, that's not what we've been taught. For many of us, it seems a bit lazy or reckless in our own lives to give up control. So as believers, I think we're constantly walking this fine line between surrender and control. And if we're honest with ourselves, we're not always good with surrender, are we? I really struggle with surrender in my own life. I think there are a couple examples in Scripture that we're going to look at today that show us some of the, the, the polar opposite uh, ways in which we can respond with this issue of control. Our first begins with our Scripture this morning. Of course, we've heard this quite a bit. This is the, uh, the second account of creation in Genesis chapter 2. We've heard this story, right? Which God places man and, and woman in the garden, and they're to till it and to keep it, and God gives them everything they need, right? There are, I imagine, this lush scenery of, of, of green and, and, and water and all the fruit they could eat, animals, everything they could want to sustain life. I mean, if, if there's any image of paradise I get, it's in that garden. Right? So, so God has cared for everything they need. And then you see in there, I think it's kind of interesting, uh, in verse 16, there seems to be a particular uh, series of events that takes place that I see takes place in my own life quite a bit. Let's look at verse 16 of chapter 2. And the Lord God commanded them, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now, I don't know what it is, but at least in my own life, when somebody tells me I shouldn't do this thing, I'm going to do it. Sounds like someone else may be uh, walking through that as well. Like, if I were to tell you to not 
think about, I don't want you to think about pink flamingos right now. Whatever you do, do not think about pink flamingos. Anybody thinking about pink flamingos? No? It's just part of our nature. I don't, I don't know why this happens, and I wish I could identify it and get rid of it in my own life. But whenever someone tells me not to do something, even if I want to obey them, there's a certain curiosity in there. Well, what's going to happen if I do? Is it really that bad? Oh, come on. It can't be that bad. See, for many of us, we for many of us, I appreciate it. I like interactions. For many of us, we see these kinds of instructions as limiting, right? Listen, I'm just trying to do me. I'm trying to live my life. Don't put limits on me, right? I'm trying to be who I'm supposed to be. Anyone ever thought those things? I think God knows us a little bit better than we know ourselves. And we see this is evident in the creation story. God gives them everything they need. All they had to do was obey this one thing. Basically, all they had to do was not do something. Right? I mean, it, it requires no act on their part to, to follow God. Everything else was taken care of for them. And then we see the serpent. And this is what I was talking about earlier, this track that kind of plays itself out in my own life. Did God really say that? What did God mean? Well, it's a good point. Maybe God didn't really mean that. Maybe uh, you notice Eve kind of added something to what God just said not to eat it, and then she said we shouldn't eat it or touch it. So all of a sudden, maybe it's kind of ambiguous. We're opening ourselves up to the possibility that maybe we can do this, and all of a sudden... Anyone ever been down that road before? We've opened ourselves up to do something we know we're not supposed to do. And with Adam and Eve, it went south pretty quickly, didn't it? I mean, I don't think it's a stretch to say that Adam and Eve failed miserably at obeying God, didn't they? But I don't think I can just look at Adam and Eve. I don't think we should look much further than our own human identity. Because as humans, we have a pretty bad track record of giving up control. You see, unfortunately, not only is, is following God a rather difficult, or is surrender a rather difficult thing, but I believe surrender is vital. It's an, it's an integral part of being a follower of God and Jesus Christ. I mean, we look at the, just some of the teachings of Jesus. If anyone uh, would, would seek to gain their life, they'll lose it. But if anyone loses their life for my sake, they'll find it. It's a little ominous, isn't it? If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Friends, giving up control is very difficult, and it is intrinsic to the Christian faith. It is very hard for us to do. There's a, uh, a, a, a bumper sticker I saw this past week, and actually came out quite a few years ago, uh, but I was reminded of it this week when I saw it. The bumper sticker, you may have seen it as well. It said simply, God is my co-pilot. Anyone ever seen those bumper stickers before? Now, I think they're kind of well-meaning, right? Like, if you imagine your own life uh, as a plane, we're allowing God into the cockpit of our own lives, into sort of the major hub, the epicenter of our lives. God gets to be in there. And so as I'm navigating my life, I'll consult with God. God's almost like the manual. If I have any problems, I can talk with God. Any questions, I can talk with God. But you know, there's, there's kind of a problem with this. And if any of you have this on your car, I apologize. No offense was meant, I promise. There's a bit of a problem with looking at God as our co-pilot. You see, if God's the co-pilot, who is the pilot? We are. If God's the co-pilot, I'm still calling the shots, Right? I can override the co-pilot any time I want, right? I'll have to check with Lanny to see how much this happens uh, in actual aviation. But there's a reason there's a co in front of it. I'm not the actual pilot. See, for many of us, we like the idea of God's presence for sure. We certainly like the ideas of God's promises. But when situations present themselves in certain ways, almost all the time, we're kind of going to seek after our own interests, aren't we? When push comes to shove, I'm going to make sure that I'm piloting my own life in a way that, that meets my own needs. 
And we see this in many different areas in our lives. We see this in our careers. Many of us have been drawn to the lure of success or money or fame. And that allowed, you know, that encourages us to take one job this way, even though we know that we may have a calling to this particular field, we're going to go this way. Or in our own families, we have questions of where to live, what schools to send our kids to. All of these very good questions. We see personal decisions that need to be made as well. At the end of the day, if we're the pilot of our own lives, we tend to turn the situation toward ourselves, don't we? I'm here to ask you, friends, what if there's a better way for us? What if that's not the only way it has to be for us as followers of Jesus? If you have your Bibles now, I invite you to, to follow along in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. If you don't, I would paraphrase it, but it may be helpful to have it in front of you. Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Like our Old Testament scripture this morning, this is one we know pretty well in the Christian faith. It's a story of the temptation of Jesus. After Jesus was, uh, was in the desert for 40 days, then he was led by the Spirit to be, tempted, uh, to, to be tempted into the desert by the devil. It said after he had fasted 40 days and nights, he was hungry. So then the tempter came to him and said, You know, Jesus, if you're the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. You've got needs. Of course, Jesus responds, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of of God. Then the devil takes him to the, the holy city and stands on the highest point of the temple. And he says, all right, Jesus, if you're the son of God, throw yourself off. Because it's written in the Bible that he will send his angels to attend to you and you will not dash your foot upon the rock. So if you're the son of God, go ahead and do it. What, what's the problem? And then Jesus, of course, tells him, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And finally, the tempter, who uh, is definitely persistent, takes him to another high point, the highest point in the city, and has a look out over everything. It says, all right, Jesus, everything you see before you will be yours. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. Finally, Jesus puts his foot down and says, away from me, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left, and angels came and attempt, attended to him. We've heard this before. The story of the temptation of Jesus. Three specific temptations. Three very unique temptations, right? The first one, the devil tempted him to, uh, and told him to, to turn stones into bread, if he's the actual son of God. Then he was tempted to throw himself off to show whether or not he's actually the son of God, if the prophecy is true and that the angels will attend to him. And then the last temptation is to, to worship the devil so that he will gain everything in front of him. And then we see Jesus as fully God, showing us what it looks like to yield to someone who's greater than him. Now, did Jesus have all the power to do those things? Absolutely. I mean, without a question. See, but you know what Jesus did? He showed us what it means to follow somebody who's greater. So remember, the scripture says that even though Jesus was fully God, didn't consider equality with God. Something to be grasped. Jesus wasn't in a power struggle. And as a human, Jesus showed us what it looks like to be completely dependent upon God. Now, if you're anything like me and you've read over these temptations, again, we've heard it before, but these seem pretty unique temptations, don't they? I mean, I've never been tempted to turn stones into bread or to throw myself off of a building. Oh, gosh, no, I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> But I think there's some underlying issues with Jesus' temptation that apply to us even today in 21st century America. Biblical commentator Douglas Hare right, uh, talks about the general temptation that all of us have to minimize who God is. He writes this. He says, we may not be tempted to turn stones into bread, but we are constantly tempted to mistrust God's readiness to empower us to face our trials. None of us is likely to put God to test by leaping from a cliff, but we are frequently tempted to question God's helpfulness when things go awry. He says, we forget the sure promise, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. We are frequently tempted to question 
question God's helpfulness when things go awry. See, friends, I mentioned that that uh, previous bumper sticker we talked about, God is my co-pilot, while it's well-meaning, it quickly drew some criticism. And one of those criticisms came in, form, in the form of a response bumper sticker. And the bumper sticker simply said this. It says, if God is your co-pilot, switch seats. <laughs> if God is your co-pilot, switch seats. Now, what a cool image that that gives us, right? Because giving up control, I'm, I'm here to encourage you in this, giving up control doesn't mean that we stop trying. It doesn't mean that we're kicked out of the control center in our own lives. It doesn't mean that we abandon ship. Giving up control simply means that as believers, our first go-to is God. That's the first person we consult. That's the first consideration we have, no matter what the situation is. And we see two extreme examples in the Bible today of how humans have handled uh, surrendering control. Adam and Eve, and then Jesus. Friends, we're called to, to give up control in our own lives. Giving up having the final say. But you may ask, how do we do that? What is that supposed to look like in my life? Well, I would suggest drawing your attention to that scripture we read in Matthew. Let's look at how Jesus responded. His first uh, response is to submit to God. I mean, Scripture and prayer, I think, are great starts for us. We believe that God is revealed to us through Scripture, and we encounter God in prayer. And Jesus' first response, he could have responded with his intellect, he could have responded with his knowledge, but what did he do? He points to the Bible. Everything, it is written, it is written. Again, I say it is written, is what Jesus said. Instead of relying on himself, Jesus yields to God and shows that he's seeking to find God in the midst of his temptation. Afterwards, I, I love this image. You notice Jesus stand, stood firm, he quoted scripture, and then after the devil left, it says that angels waited on him. I love that because again, Jesus is God, that is for sure. He's also a human. And he was hungry and he was fasting for 40 days like many of us are. We're tired. It's a reminder for us that we can't do this journey in life alone. We need other people with us, encouraging us, strengthening us. And as we see with the angels do, doing with Jesus, we need people shouldering our burdens, walking with us. So we begin surrendering control by spending time in the Word, learning about God and allowing God to reveal to us who God is. We spend time in prayer and connect with God, and then we surround ourselves with other people who are seeking to follow God as well. See, when we give up control in our lives, we're giving up the ability to have the final say, and that is hard. That makes us uncomfortable. We do it in our personal lives, in our church lives, in our community lives. We do it on a momentary and on a daily and on a monthly and on a lifetime basis. That's hard work. There is deep surrender in that. But I'm here to tell you that with release, there's also a certain amount of freedom that can be found. Friends, there's actually great freedom to be found in the fact that the hope and the joy that we want in our lives can't come from human hands. So when we give up control, we're actually opening ourselves up to the joy and salvation that God offers. You know what, God? I'm not pretending that I know what is next. I'm not pretending that I know what is best for me, so you show me what is best. Since we can't provide it in our own lives, maybe we're actually open to the one who can. There's a song that came out uh, by, uh, by Stephen Curtis Chapman in 2001. The song came out and says, that the song is called God is God. And in it, he's comparing our lives to a painting that is painted, or a picture that's painted by God. And he writes, Simply in, in the chorus, it says, God is God and I am not. I can only see a part of the picture he's painting. God is God and I am man, so I'll never understand it all. For only God is God. As followers of the way, I'm here to tell you that we are not masters of our own destiny. And thank God for that. See, giving up control of our lives can be scary and unnerving and unpredictable. But the one who calls us to follow him has a much fuller view of the picture of creation. So the simple question remains for us. Are we willing to switch 